The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So just quickly before I dive into the sermon, the Athanasian Creed reflects two uh, uses of uh, archaic words. The first is uh, Catholic, right? In the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, we have uh, famously changed that to Christian or universal, depending on, on when the hymnal came out following Martin Luther's example, because that's what Catholic means. It means the universal or the Christian church. And it came about in contrast with the Donatists who were uh, very, very much purist and thought some Christians weren't actually Christian and wanted to kick them out of the church. And so when Augustine writes of the Catholic church, he's not writing of the Roman Catholic church, but he's writing of the universal church. And so the word Catholic is retained there in the Athanasian Creed. Also, notice we said the Catholic religion, and that really makes us say, hey, we're Lutherans, right? Well, that's, again, an archaic use of the word religion, which means the acts of our faith. So our, our Christian acts of faith compel us to confess the Trinity, right? That is what Orthodoxy, Orthodox Christianity is based upon right teaching. So um, I wanted to say all that because I know that makes some people really, really squeamish when we say this, and I've never explained why those words are still in the Athanasian Creed, why, why we haven't translated it, them into something else. And it's probably because most people only use this creed one Sunday out of the year, and this is the Sunday that they use it. And they said, well, why update something that nobody's ever even reading anyway? Um, and then we we're like, or I was like, you know what? We're just gonna do it every fifth Sunday. Ha! Huh. Right? Um, but we skipped it on Easter because it was Easter. <laughs> and it was already a long Sunday. So let's get into our sermon here. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah 6, 3. And that is a very, very much deep end verse. The first thing to notice is that the Lord is in all caps. And the Old Testament uses Lord in all caps to signify that the actual word being used there is the tetragram, Yahweh, the name given at the burning bush. And the reason why we don't actually say that is because we kept the, the uh, Jewish practice, for first century Christians, we're primarily from Jewish heritage, we kept the practice of not wanting to accidentally misuse the name of the Lord, so we just don't use it at all. Even there, I just said we don't want to misuse the name of the Lord, right? No, it's we don't want to misuse the name of Yahweh, the name of God. But it's just so ingrained to us. And so that is there. And then holy, holy, holy. If you look at it in the Hebrew, something amazing happens, right? This is the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the God of hosts, Yahweh of hosts. Sabaoth is not to be confused with Sabbath, by the way. Sabbath is Saturday, the day of rest. Sabaoth means host, army multitude, okay? Holy, 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 right? We read that in English. You read it in Hebrew, and I don't know why we don't translate it this way in English because it means so much more, and it's a proper translation. The holy one, the holy one, the holy one. That's what the seraphim are shouting to one another. That is what is making the heavens shake. The holy one, the holy one, the holy one. Now, why would you say the Holy One three times? Hmm, I wonder, does it have something to do maybe with the Trinity? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yeah. This is the Lord of the universe. And Isaiah says something that is utterly shocking to anybody who is not an Israelite at this time. Now, for us, it's old hat. We have grown up as Christians. We've been baptized, many of us as infants. We have learned that God is all-powerful, that God is all-knowing, and the God, that God is everywhere. That is basic God 101 that gets drilled into us as kids. So much so that we even have the hymn, you know, a sweet hour of prayer, right? Because God is everywhere. God knows what you're going through. Whether you're happy or whether you're sad, take it to God in prayer. God will hear you. Well, Isaiah is preaching to an apostate people, people who are following false gods. And the thing about the pagan gods is, is that pagan gods are local. You have the god of the river, and you have the god of the mountain. 
you might have the god of the sky and that god of the sky might or might not have lightning powers who knows he might be zeus he might be thor right to put that kind of in our context it'd be like if we worshiped a god of mustang and then there was a god of the red river and there's a god of the Cimarron River, and there's a god of the Canadian River, right? And then there was the, there was the god of, of a harvest, okay? But there's also the god of planting. And there's the god of nice people, and there's the god of jerks, right? But Isaiah here, confessing basically Genesis, this is the god of everything. His glory fills the whole earth. He's not a local god he is the universal God. Everything in existence is because of him. And again, we've been drilled into that. That is old hat for us, but that is radical. And the thing about it is, is we often approach God like pagans. After we try in all our efforts to do something, Okay, I can't do it on my own. I guess I'll ask God to help. But he is the Lord of hosts. He is the great God. And this great God is not a God who is far off. This is Isaiah, who is the prophet of prophets. If you don't know who to credit with somebody saying something in the Old Testament, you just say the prophet, meaning Isaiah. All right? And what is Isaiah's reaction to having heaven opened up to him in, verse, uh, in, in chapter 6 here? Right? I love this because I think these should be our words as well. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Yahweh of hosts. Here is the prophet of prophets, and his reaction is, is I am toast. That smiting lightning is about to strike right now. He's in the middle of the temple worshiping. He opens up his eyes and he sees that he is also in the heavenly courts. And there is God. I am undone, as one translation puts it. And instead, what happens is, is one of these seraphim that just cried out, the holy one, the holy one, the holy one, takes a burning coal from the, from the incense fire and touches his lips and says now you are purified now i'm not saying go and purify yourself by creating a fire taking some coal and touching it to your lips please don't do that at your barbecues today and if you do do it when you're in the er don't say pastor ross told me to do this all right but what's amazing here is that god is not far off but god comes to isaiah And God uses one of his messengers to purify Isaiah so that Isaiah can be in the presence of God and hear God's message. And why is that amazing? Because as I told the little kids a little bit ago, in baptism, the creator of the universe, the Lord of hosts, whose glory fills the whole universe, the earth rotates around the sun by the power of God. He placed his name upon you. The God who created you, who poured out his blood to redeem you, has now put his spirit inside of you. You are the temple of God. The holy, perfect, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-everywhere God has chosen you you to be his home and you sit there if you're like me woe is me because I'm not just only a man of unclean lips unclean thoughts unclean actions and heck I just have to open up the newspaper to know that my whole people my whole nation my whole country my whole world is like that as well but in coming to you in baptism, in placing his name upon you, he has purified you. He has made you holy so that the Holy One can be with you forever. 
When we talk about sanctification, we often think of it as this, this, this ever-increasing line, right? We start way down here when we're, when we're justified, when we're baptized, and as we live our life, we become more and more holy. The truth of the matter is, is that when you are justified, you are perfectly holy. Now, living out that sanctification, by the way, it's not always, it, it, it's a stock market graph, okay? As I said in Bible study, some days are better than other days, all right? Some days you are very well sanctified, and other days you are just yelling at people because, my goodness, won't these stubborn people just finally get it, right? But the Lord has chosen you. He has washed away his sin. And he has placed his name upon you and made you his holy temple. And now here's the thing. That's a wonderful thing. That's also a scary thing. I love to tell this story. Just This is my example. On Vicarage, I got a call. The, the pastor was, um, he was gone at a funeral, uh, a family member's funeral. So he was out of town. Got a call from a landlord asking me to come and mediate a dispute between him and his renter. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. And he's like, every other church has turned me down. Can you please do this? So, so I go, I pull up to this house, which is dilapidated, overgrown. Some of the windows are boarded up. I'm like, I'm about to get murdered, I think, right? This is, this is how like the first 48 hours starts, right? Okay. Um, but I go, I knock on the door. These guys just yell at each other for an hour. I mean, they spend an hour just yelling at each other. I don't know what I do. I, I just, like, I'm not, I'm sitting there most of the time just being quiet. Finally, like, okay, I, I gotta go, guys. Like, and they're like, oh, thank you. You helped us so much. I'm like, I didn't do anything. Right? But I'm walking out the door, and the guy goes, the, the landlord goes, um, do you believe in the Trinity? Are you a Trinitarian Christian? I said, yes, I am. He goes, all right, brother because I was in northern, extreme northern California, six hours north of San Francisco, where the people that moved there thought the hippies in San Francisco were too conservative. That's how hippie-ish it was. So when he says, all right, brother, I mean, this is, this is an old school hippie, right? He goes, all right, brother, father, son, and mother earth. And I was like, different trinity. <laughs> but I tell, I tell that story because when the name of God is placed upon you, sometimes he takes you to places where you don't want to go. We famously, this is, this is all across our newspapers this, this past 24 hours, there was that couple in Haiti that operated an orphanage. God had placed them there. And unfortunately, the forces of darkness, they are dead. But God placed them there. God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, right? God might bring us to uncomfortable places because as his holy temple... We bring Jesus, we bring God, we bring the testimony of the Holy Spirit to the world. And we're not just to keep it to ourselves, we're not just to keep it to these walls, we're not just to keep it to safe places. Now we are blessed in our country that we can worship our God in truth and faith and not be persecuted for it, but there are Christians around the world who can't. And there are people around the world who need to know the gospel message. And so God might call you to Mustang, Oklahoma, and God might call you to Baghdad, Iraq. That's what it means when his name is upon you. But does that mean that God removes his hand from you if bad things happen because of that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But the Lord uses us to witness to him. One last story. There's a guy named St. Boniface. Have you ever heard of him? St. Boniface is really popular right now today. St. Boniface went to Germanic tribes who worshipped uh, the Viking gods, okay? And he kind of hacked them off. They were kind of mad at him. And they went off, right? And they said, you know, our god Thor is going to strike you dead. And they came back and they found Boniface right next to the root of a stump, or uh, right next to a stump. Because when they were gone, what did he do? He took an ax and he chopped down Thor's tree. And nothing bad happened to him. And these Germanic tribes said, uh, maybe there's something actually about this guy's God and not this other God that we worship. And people like that story. People forget how Boniface, how his life ended. Later, he went to the Frisians. The Frisians uh, lived in modern-day Netherlands. 
He was going there to give some final instruction to some catechumens and to perform baptisms. And so he was there on the edge of a river, there with his camp. And it was foggy. And they heard people coming. Turned out it wasn't the catechumens. It was a gang of robbers. And they killed them all. Boniface's last words are recorded as telling his followers, put down your swords, for the kingdom of God is not won through swords. Now here's the thing. Boniface died in a tragic way. But God even used that to convert people. Because what would it take for a man to lay down his sword in the face of danger and to not perform harm on somebody who wasn't a Christian and so thereby, through their actions, if that person were to die in a state of unbelief? And so he is considered a saint, not for chopping down Thor's tree, because he literally gave his life for God. Now I pray that all of us don't have to lay down our lives. But I also warn you, it is a possibility. This is what it means to have the name of the Lord upon us. It is a great responsibility. It is a freeing responsibility. We are free in Christ Jesus of our sins. But we also aren't to take our treasure and hide it, but to show it to the whole world, even to those who hate the message. In Christ's name, amen.